Hi, it's Robin. I've got my Commodore 128 here. This is the flat model, as it's sometimes called, as opposed to the 128D I've been using in previous episodes. And today we're going to look at some Easter eggs, bugs, and if, if you don't mind me calling them secrets or little known features of the Commodore 128. Now I've chosen the flat Commodore 128 because it was produced before the 128D and has a number of bugs in it that don't exist that were fixed in the 128D model in the ROMs. So the way you can tell which ROM set you have is simply looking at the boot up message here. And if it says copyright 1985, as many flat 128s do, then you've got the old ROMs. If it says 1986, then you've got the newer ROMs. Now there may be some flat 128s with 1986 ROMs, but typically the flat machine has the older ROMs. This one was produced in September 1986 and still had the older ROMs in it. And one other thing that's hidden here in plain sight, so to speak, Microsoft is actually mentioned in the boot up screen for the Commodore 128. In all the previous Commodore machines, BASIC was based on Microsoft BASIC, but not acknowledged. We'll look at the famous Easter egg that Probably everybody who knows about the C128 knows about this Easter egg. Just issue this sys command, and it displays the people who made the Commodore 128, the software and the hardware, or herdware, as it's mentioned here, along with their peace message about linking arms, don't make them. What a bunch of hippies. There's another similar Easter egg hidden in the C128, but not as well known. Thanks to David Yaud for showing me this one. Just have to peek memory here. So this is just looping through memory, printing some characters that are hidden in the ROM. And there we go. It's the same Fred Bowen, Terry Ryan, who are both engineers at Commodore, mentioned on that previous page. And... I'm not sure if we know 100% who this is, but Bill Hurd suggested it might be Mike Isger, and I tried to look up some information on him. All I could find is that he appears to be a software tester of the Commodore 128. Okay, those are the two Easter eggs I'm aware of. Moving on to some hidden features or secrets. I assume everybody knows that the Commodore 128 has a very compatible Commodore 64 mode built in, but there's several ways of getting to that. For example, if you're in C128 mode, you can type go64, and you can do that with or without a space. C128 conveniently has a reset switch on the side, or reset button on the side. So if you reset or power up with the Commodore key held down here in the corner, it also goes into C64 mode. There's a couple other ways of getting into it. There's a sys command, 65357. Also, and this one might be obvious, but if you plug a C64 cartridge into the 128, it detects that and automatically boots into C64 mode as well. So if you already knew about all those ways, especially using the Commodore key to boot up, there's another feature that I think is lesser known. If you hold down the stop or run stop key while you reset the computer, it actually boots up into the built-in machine code monitor. It's a very handy feature. If your program has crashed, you can get right into the monitor, but it's even more useful than that. If, for example, you have a program in memory like you know, something like print high. What's interesting is that if you reset with the stop key held down and go into the monitor, it actually doesn't clear memory. So if you exit and then list, even basic programs survive that kind of reset. So extremely handy feature for debugging. Now one limitation of the Commodore 64 is that it only has 1K nibbles, just 4-bit RAM of color memory. Now the C128 somewhat addresses this problem by giving you two banks that can be switched between. So first you have to poke 216, 255 to disable the automatic operating system control of that color RAM. 
And once you've done that, then you can poke one, comma, peak one, and 252, and that will switch color RAM to bank zero. And it's uninitialized here, so that's why it's full of different colors. And then you can poke one, peak one, or three. You notice that as you type in, it does initialize that color memory as you type on it. If we poke this, it switches to bank one of color RAM, which is actually the default for the text mode. Bank zero is used for the high res bitmap and bank one, which we're in now is used for text mode. So if we initialize color RAM, this is at D800 hex, fill it with black. And then if we switch back, see there's our rainbow again, and now we can fill color RAM with say color one. With a single poke, we can switch between the color RAM. That's potentially powerful for games, having a second bank of RAM that can be switched to in an instant. And note, you can actually toggle, there's actually two bits to control this, one for what the video chip sees and one for what the CPU sees. So you can actually have the VIC displaying one while the CPU writes to the other bank. Now this isn't as useful for games as I thought it would be at first because you can't quickly copy from one bank of color RAM to the other because the CPU can only see one at a time. Most scrolling games shift color RAM by doing a byte copy where they shift everything by one byte left or right to scroll left or right or 40 bytes up or down to scroll up and down and unfortunately you can't do that with double buffering with this kind of RAM copying from one bank to the other because you'd have to do a, a store in between each one. So this isn't as powerful for games as it could have been. It's still better than the C64. Okay, moving on to some bugs. A number of these are only in the 1985 ROMs, but they are still very common because a lot of C128s were sold like this. So a number of these bugs I'm about to show were solved in the 128D. One funny one is that the caps lock key here, which is different than the shift lock, will switch to lowercase by holding down shift and Commodore. Shift lock is like a caps lock key, but it also automatically shifts like the number keys. So the caps lock key is a true caps lock where it does uppercase for the keyboard, but leaves things like the number keys as is unshifted. But what's amusing is that there's a bug in this original ROM where every letter is capitalized except Q. <laughs> Q is lowercase. So that's an oversight in the lookup table for the key mappings. Another one is that in all other Commodore Basics, if you try to list something like list A, for example, you'll get a syntax error. We'll only accept a numeric value there. But in C128 mode, you can try doing a list A, and it actually is okay with that, but it's not a useful feature. It's not actually reading a variable. If you try to list B, that works, but if you try to list, I don't know, dog, then you get a syntax error. And if we have a short program like 10 print hello, you can do list 10 and it will show. But if you set A to 10 and then list A, it doesn't print that line. Just a strange quirk in how list is interpreted. Another one is if you print 2 to the power of 15 on the C64, you get, as you should, 32768. But on the 128, you get these extra unnecessary and incorrect decimal places. So again, a fairly minor bug in how the multiply routine works. A C128 has an interesting split screen mode where if you do this command, graphic two comma one, it will actually initialize the top of the screen as high res. And then these bottom five lines, you can type instructions in, has this character command so that you can plot characters to the high res screen. So I'll print an A up there. And then you can actually copy 
that bitmap into a variable. So I'm going to copy it into a string from location 00 in the top corner to 88 in the bottom right corner. Okay, so now if we display a string, here's the string representation of the bitmap of the letter A. And we can tell there's a pixel cursor, so to speak. And we can tell it, for example, move the cursor, the move the high res cursor to location 160, comma 50. So it's horizontally the middle of the screen, 50 pixels down. And then we can draw that bitmap at that location. And there it is, it's plotted it to the screen. And then we can move that cursor again with that locate command. If you put a plus in front of any number, it will do a relative move. So for example, if we want to move 20 to the right and 10 pixels down, we can do that. And then we'll plot that A there. But there's a bug in how the locate, it should also allow negative. So I'll move 40 to the left. Actually you get an illegal quantity error on any negative numbers. Again, this was fixed in the newer ROM. That was a pretty big bug. It's allowing relative movement, but only positive. So we're back in C64 mode. Here's a feature I think a lot of people don't know. So you can actually open a file to the screen for reading. So that's uh, device number three. We'll input from three into a string, and then we'll just print out what we got from the screen. So if we just type hello there, and we'll run it on the line above, it's actually reading the screen into variable a string. So you can actually input, not just from the keyboard, but from the screen, something that's already on the screen. So this is how it should work. Replicate that program on the 128. And you get instead a string too long error. So this feature is just completely broken in the original ROMs. Unlike the 64, the 128 has a lot of features that make programming and basic easier, such as this play command that will play music back instead of the long sequence of pokes. So for example, you can play a little tune voice one, octave two, instrument type five, piano, then the U command, which strangely is for the volume, I guess because V is already used for voice. I indicates that the next notes are going to be quarter notes, and we'll play D, E, F, and G that way. Q for quarter note, the note E. Back to an eighth note for C, and a whole D note. And we'll play that. It's a little Adam Neely shout out there. Now, U15 should be full volume, but it turns out that there's a bug where only the last digit of the volume is red. So we'll play that with volume 5, which is exactly the same volume. The maximum volume it can handle is actually 9. And if we switch to volume 10, it's actually volume 0, like basically muted. And then volume 11 is volume 1. Can hear that <laughs> and so on it gets louder and so volume 19 is the same as volume 9 which is the maximum because of this bug and in fact you can actually eliminate the u because it really is only reading that last digit and if you put a one there it'll be considered volume one Okay, in the last one, there's this R sprite command, which reads the registers of the sprites. And it's actually one base, so we can read the current status of sprite one, characteristic zero, which is whether the sprite is enabled or not, and the sprite right now is off. So it just returns a zero, as you might expect. 
Now that should work from sprites 1 through 8. As you expect, there are 8 sprites on the Commodore 128 because it's basically the same VIC chip as in the Commodore 64. But curiously, you can actually go to sprite 9 and all the way up to sprite 16. But as soon as you go to sprite 17, then you get an illegal quantity error. So it's very interesting when they were developing the basic, were they thinking that there would be 16 sprites available on the 128, either due to an improved VIC chip, which would be awesome, or maybe just a built-in sprite multiplexer that would give you a virtual 16 sprites with some sort of uh, screen splitting. Anyway, that again was corrected in the 128D ROMs. Okay, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that little look at the various bugs. I'm not trying to imply that this is a crap computer. The basic's actually very powerful, even in the slightly buggy version, and it's especially good in the 128D. I should have another video coming up soon about the Commodore 128. Okay, one last secret. If you type in Go65, then it actually shows a preview of the Commodore 65 that was coming up next. A lot of people don't know about this secret either. Okay, we'll talk to you next time.